feel very called to become a member of the Catholic Church. Love the Catholic Church. It's just the best place to be. From the studios of EWTN, this is Open Line. In North America, call toll-free 1-800-585-9396. That's 1-800-585-9396. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. You can also send an email to openline at EWTN.com. A tremendous Thursday, it's Friday, a tremendous Friday to each and every one of you. We are glad you took some time out of your day to join us on EWTN's Open Line Friday. I am all out of sorts because Colin Donovan is not in the studio with us. Colin is feeling a little under the weather today, and uh, but fear not, we have a very uh, qualified and capable substitute for Colin, and we'll introduce to you, him to you in just one moment. If you've got a question for today's program, we're talking theology, church teaching, scripture, and the like. The number's 1-800-585-9396. That's toll-free anywhere in North America. 1-800-585-9396. If you're outside the United States and Canada, your number is one 205 that's one two zero five two seven one two nine eight five, and we'll put you straight to the front of the line, or you can send us an email open line at ewtn dot com. As I said, Colin is a little bit under the weather today, and we are efforting to reach our substitute host today. He will be no uh, will not be a stranger to many of you. Uh, he is a uh, former theology advisor here at EWTN. Now he is currently the director of special projects at Ave Maria Radio. He's a regular member of the Fellowship of Catholic Scholars and author of the book The Biblical Roots of the Mass by Sophia Institute Press. Tom has served the church professionally for more than 25 years, including more than eight as I mentioned, as a theology advisor here at EWTN. He's also a speaker on various Catholic topics. You hear him on Catholic Answers Live. You've heard him here on Open Line, and you're going to hear him again today on Open Line. Mr. Nash, how in the world are you? Hey, brother. Good to be with you today. How are you? I am fantastic, thank you. I I, I didn't quite know when the show was supposed to start, but other than that, I'm doing okay. <laughs> yeah, we had a problem there. With the area. I'm in South Bend, Indiana. My niece is getting married this weekend, tomorrow. And uh, I was uh, thinking old area code instead of more updated area code. So that was uh, my fault. (laughs) (laughs) But I had the number right otherwise. So, Tom, tell us a little bit here at the beginning of the program exactly what it is you're doing for our good friends there at Ave Maria Radio. Well, in particular, I'm uh, helping raise uh, financial support for various uh, projects that we have at at, uh, Ave Maria Radio, including... Uh, infrastructural needs that we have right now, certain things that we have as far as our operating system in general needs to be uh, replaced or updated given the fact uh, we've been on the air 20 years, and so some of that, as you know, over time needs to be uh, replaced because of uh, natural wear and tear and, and the life expectancy of certain products. So I'm working on that right now, and in the process I do some speaking, as you said, and that helps to generate uh, connections and contacts with people so as to aid the cause of uh, of uh, getting the word out about Ave Maria and, and letting people know of our needs and, and generating support for those needs. Do you miss us? I do miss you, but I'm glad that I can still be connected with you in ways like this and, of course, that Ave Maria and E.W. Chen are close partners, as well as the fact that the Church is universal, so we're always together in spirit, if not always there face-to-face. Well, we have an anonymous email to kick things off today. It says, Hello, Tom. In my diocese, it has evolved in recent years that Eucharistic ministers, and probably more accurately described, extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion, are used for the distribution of Holy Communion. This, now in several parishes, has evolved further into the laity purifying the vessels after Mass is finished. I find this unnecessary and feel it should be a priest only who purifies the vessels after Holy Communion. I'd appreciate your comments and a reference to Church teaching with regard to what is allowed. Yes. Uh, and it would really be on liturgical norms as opposed to specifically an unchangeable teaching. And deacons can help out in this regard. Also sacristans, for example, James Deering is a sacristan and long time and does a great job at EW10 and 
uh, the Our Lady of the Angels Chapel right there on the EW Chen campus in Irondale. So you can have a lay person serve as a sacristan, and then even in some cases an extraordinary minister. Uh, the churches, um, with regard to the norms that were put down in the early 2000s, uh, the general instruction of the Roman Missal allows even U.S. bishops to go beyond uh, what was provided there to have specific norms on communion or both kinds in particular, which has become a common experience. And as you say, extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion, not just Eucharistic ministers, because they, the, the ordinary ministers would be a priest or a deacon, and anyone, a layperson, would be an extraordinary minister. So that with regard to lay people, they can be allowed to serve in that capacity, but it, a priest would be first, a deacon second, then a layman who is appointed as a sacristan, if they have one at the parish, usually that's the case, uh, he or she would um, provide that service. And uh, that's how I go. But the general instruction of the Roman Missal, the latest one which came out in the early 2000s, number 283, provides that each diocesan bishop has, um, can provide additional norms uh, for the distribution of communion of both kinds. So it'd be good to check wherever anonymous is in their diocese and check out what the norms may be for the um, for the distribution by the local bishop, and just to make sure, and to check with the, the priest as well, the pastor, and perhaps some people are doing and have been not appointed, and maybe it's just become a common uh, habit, well-meaning, but not well-founded, and therefore, if there's a sacristan there or a deacon there at the Mass, they should be doing that first and foremost, and only when truly in a need. Uh, but again, there's some latitude that a bishop has, so I'd, I'd encourage them First of all, let them know that it's not necessarily a problem, and secondly, to see what the local diocesan norms are. We received an email Monday when John Martinoni was in the chair, and he suggested that they uh, call back or, or wait for an answer on Friday with Colin. And the question was, what is the significance of the priest breaking a little piece of the host into the chalice during Mass? Yes, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas gives us uh, good food for thought on this, no pun intended, or I guess pun, <laughs> pun intended. He speaks about how... Uh, first, it's the breaking of Christ's body and the passion, you know, that the, the breaking of the body of the, of the fraction rite, which comes after the consecration, is symbolic of Christ's passion. And secondly, it denotes um, the various states of the mystical body of Christ. You know, the, we have the Church uh, militant here on earth, the Church suffering in purgatory, and the Church triumphant in heaven. And he also mentions that the breaking of the bread reminds us, uh, it's kind of like St. Paul tells us, that we are one body, yet many members, yet we're all united. So... In that regard, we can see that even though there, it is through Christ, the beautiful thing, um, that we are, the body is broken, um, excuse me, that Christ's body is broken, but it's on our behalf, and it, it's through his death and resurrection and ascension to heaven, his paschal mystery, which we uh, participate anew in offering again uh, at every Mass, as well as receive, that those graces come to us. So it's... Um, it shows the various states of the mystical body, and it should see in the process, I should clarify that it, on the third way that he says it's the distribution of graces that proceed from Christ's passion, because we can, the Church would teach that, does teach that at the separation, you know, the body and blood, uh, when it poured out from Christ on the cross, that the Church was conceived at the foot of the cross with the flowing out of the blood, blood and uh, water of Jesus, and that born... So we see the distinction between conception and birth, born on Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes. And as well, you can say that there's symbol symbolism is, of, of course, of our Lord in the breaking of the bread following what he did at Mass, uh, the first Mass on the Last Supper, and then also on uh, the first post-resurrectional Mass, where they came to know him on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, in the breaking of the bread. So all those uh, are symbolically, and, and first and foremost, denoting that our Lord, it's, uh, it's a showing of the breaking of his body and the passion, which, though it seemed like a terrible loss at the time, was such a great victory because it is through that death and resurrection and ascension of Christ, his paschal mystery, that we, the Church, exist and that we have life uh, and uh, unto eternity we hope and pray. We're underway on an open line Friday. Tom Nash sitting in for Colin Donovan. I'm awake now, so we are underway and ready to roll. Straight, straight ahead, we'll talk to Ron in Colorado. We've got plenty of time for your phone calls at 1-800-585-9396. Open line Friday with Tom Nash. 
I invite people to tune in to Women of Grace Live if they want to be encouraged, if they want to be instructed, if they want to be inspired. These opportunities present themselves not only through what we have to share on the air, but through the many calls that come in through our listeners. I am always amazed at how my own faith is edified through what our listeners share with us. I'm Johnette Benkovic, inviting you to join me weekday mornings at 11 Eastern for Women of Grace on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Father's Day is Sunday, and EWTN Religious Catalog has a huge selection of memorable gifts just for Dad, including warrior rosaries, St. Michael icons, mugs, books, DVDs, and more. Show Dad just how much he means to you, and directly support the important work and mission of EWTN. Shop today at EWTNRC.com. Have a happy Father's Day from EWTN Religious Catalog. Podcasts of Open Line are available within 24 hours of live broadcast. Go to EWTN.com and click on Multimedia. This is Janet Benkovic, host of Women of Grace. Hello, this is Cardinal Donald Wuerl of the Archdiocese of Washington. This is Gloria Purvis, host of Morning Glory. Thanks for listening to the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question or comment, call 1-800-585-9396. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Be sure to give us a like on Facebook. Go to Facebook.com slash EWTN Radio and click the like button. We would certainly appreciate it and follow us. Uh, we'll keep you abreast on that Facebook page of everything going on here at EWTN Radio. To the phones we go. Our leadoff hitter today is Ron in Longmont, Colorado, listening to EWTN on Denver Catholic Radio. Ron, what's your question today for Tom Nash? Oh, my question is, last night um, I was at a Stevens minister meeting. I'm a Stevens minister in, at St. John the Baptist here in Longmont. And the, we had discussion about... If you go to one of your care receivers and they can't receive communion, and when you're finished you have Eucharist left, what to do with it? Okay, and, and, and so at and that some, point, in other words, they couldn't receive because they couldn't physically receive, Ron? I mean, because yes, it would have been or, health issues? Or that, or that you, had, you had anticipated more Having than more. what yes. was there, and so you took one or two hosts Got too it. many. Got it. At that point, you can either consume it yourself or return it back to the um, to your parish church in the tabernacle. And if maybe after, say, this is in the evening, right, we're getting over to the parish church and the rectory and the tabernacle would be a challenge. Uh, it might not be so convenient. Maybe Father's not available, etc. You don't have a key to get in. Then just consuming it reverently would be a good thing. Um, if you don't have another person who you know is Catholic and uh, is disposed uh, spiritually to receive. Does that make sense? But I've heard yes. that only a priest can self-communicate. Yes, that is true, but then self-communication, that's within Mass, right? That's, that's talking about there. So in a case like this, where you're talking about the circumstances, where at that point you're receiving, it's not like you're going up and distributing communion to yourself within the context of the Mass. For example, uh, the person, when you have an extraordinary, um, you can have communion, a communion service, right? That's outside of Mass, right? And so somebody, in that kind of a situation, uh, you know, somebody might receive from somebody else, but when you're talking about leftover hosts, it's a different situation than, uh, and when you're serving as an extraordinary minister and helping people out, that's a different uh, liturgical situation than is in the Mass. You are certainly correct that within the context of the Mass, there is to be no self-communication. However, when one is um, at that point going to and, and receiving, excuse me, distributing communion to the sick, one could in that case receive it it's, uh, or give, consume the host because it's outside of the, the, the classic liturgical situation of Mass. Um, one could also, I mean, oftentimes you're, you're giving it to people who are not so able to, to help out. If there's someone there and you would feel better and they are deputed as an extraordinary minister of Holy Communion and you want to receive from them, you could do that as well. But it's not, it's not as um, 
hard and fast a rule when you're talking about outside the mass, and you've gone in good faith and thought that you would have, say, several people, you know, five people in there, and there being four received, and then you would receive yourself. The stipulation there, though, if you had already received once that day, you shouldn't, because it is clear in the Church's norms that if one has already received Holy Communion once during the day, the second time they, sh- they need to receive it in the context of the Mass. In that case, if you've already received it once that day, Ron, then I would um, go back and uh, make sure if you can get it in and, and let Father know. And if you can't get it in, then, then just you know, guard it uh, reverently and, until the next morning when you can. And at that point, uh, return to the Church. Does that or you're still not... And dissolve it, and then... No, I'm not saying dissolve it. it. I'm saying take it back to the church, and they can put that in the tabernacle, or Father might consume it at that point, if you had okay. already received once yourself. But the next point, you mean you'd hold it in your home overnight? Well, if that's the situation, it's not... It's, okay. You know what I'm saying? Some of these things are... It's uh, we, we try to follow the church's rules, but in serving the poor, uh, serving those in need, serving the sick, that... Yes. We, in doing so, circumstances may come up which are not ideal, and so we uh, do our best to show reverence to the Eucharist. And if you were not, and if you'd already received right and yes. that day, and therefore could not take that communion uh, yourself, then the next best thing, if you can't get it back to the church, is there's there's nothing wrong as long as it's being, um, you know, it's it's kind of like given the circumstances. You can uh, have the, the Eucharist overnight. It's an unusual situation. You just show proper reverence to it. You know, okay. as, if you, as if you have it, I mean, you have it in a Pix, right? Uh, Pix is a oh, yeah, container absolutely. for people who don't know that you, one takes communion to the sick. And it's a little um, typically gold container. could be silver, roundish to fit the host in. And so when you yes. do that, you, would, um, you, know, you do the best you can. And if you can't, then you bring it home and you treat it reverently, and then you bring it back to Father in the morning. Okay. Would it, would it be... Like I'm married, yes, sir. Would it be okay if I would we'd say a little service and give it to my wife? Yes, you know you're familiar, I'm sure, as giving to communion for the for those shut-ins and whatnot. You know the whole the the smaller the sort of ritual. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. If you wanted to give that to your wife, that'd be fine. If she hadn't received okay. communion that day, I just feel funny about keeping. Oh, I understand that, and that's why I'm sure, given, I mean, I can just tell from talking to you that you would be certainly reverent with the Eucharist, and if your wife wanted to and you wanted to go through the liturgical rite outside of Mass to give her communion, that would be perfectly fine, uh, assuming she hadn't received already once that day. Right, okay. All right. Thank you. You've helped a lot. Thank you, Ron. Ron. I I appreciate you you guys in in the time you guys put into this, because I I do appreciate Catholic Radio. Well, you're welcome, and God bless you in Colorado. Thank you. You're welcome. Next stop for us, the great state of Nebraska. Chris is driving through Nebraska listening to EWTN on Spirit Catholic Radio. Chris, you're on with Tom Nash. Hi, Tom. Thanks for taking my question here. You're welcome. Uh, we're going through a little bit of a Bible study type thing here and had a question come up that has been bugging us for a couple weeks. We wanted to get your guys' opinion. What happens to St. Joseph? You know, that's funny, that, and not to be too flippant about it, but when I hear your question, where did St. Joseph go, it reminds me of that old Simon and Garfunkel song about where did you, where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> More specifically, St. Joseph is fine and well in the Church. The question, or I guess the point is, are we recognizing that? He's certainly recognized in when we have adoration, uh, asking for the prayers, you know, our St. Joseph, your most chaste spouse, uh, with regard to the Blessed Mother. Um, so... Uh, in that regard, St. Joseph, I guess it's a question of not where did he go, but are we taking advantage of him as the protector of the Holy Family and a great intercessor for, for us? After all, he is known as St. Joseph, Terror of Demons, T-E-R-R-O-R, of Demons. You know, we hear the word terrorist out there in the news today, and it's something bad, but here it's something good, obviously, because he is a special role in fending off evil spirits. And so we should take, you know, I, I must confess, I, I invoke him often um, with regard to, to help in spiritual warfare myself. So I would encourage St. Joseph, usually there are St. Joseph statues at most churches or at many churches. So I, I'm, when you say, um, where did he go, is it a question of that he's not mentioned so much at your church, or you don't have devotion to him, or he's not invoked, or... Because he certainly, 
ready and able to, to serve us if we are disposed towards him. Is Chris still there? Uh, yeah. Is, is there an official church teaching? He goes, uh, you know, he's there when they lose Jesus and they find him in the temple, and then the turn is made, didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? And then St. Joseph is never mentioned again. Oh, uh, I see what you're saying. So in other words, where did he go after that? Well, yeah. there you have, I mean, according to tradition, that um, Joseph, even though, I mean, again, you don't hear much of Mary, you from the wedding at Cana, you have a couple times where she appears later, and then, of course, at the foot of the cross and afterwards. But St. Joseph is understood to be that faithful uh, father, and um, some traditions hold that he was a bit older than Mary, and that um, you know maybe he died before Jesus uh, Jesus's uh, death and resurrection, because we hear her being referenced right in Scripture, right. but we don't hear of him. We do hear him references in this the son of Mary and Joseph, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, like who is this kind of person? Who does he think he is? It's not in that regard in, from a scriptural standpoint. It's not especially clear, so we have small t traditions as to what happened to him, but nothing definitive, if that's what you're asking. Yep, that's exactly what I was wondering. Beautiful. Glad we got All that right. cleared up. Great. Thank you very much. You're Thanks, welcome. Chris. Appreciate the phone call. That opens up a line for you at 1-800-585-9396. Next up is Rosa, who's listening in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, to EWTN Radio. Rosa, what's your question today for Tom? Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Tom and uh yeah, I appreciate it. Um, I'm calling in regards to the evangelists. Mm-hmm. Um, they are sometimes uh, the Gospels during the week are repeated. Uh, maybe it's by a different evangelist, uh, especially these hard things that um, we um, can't turn our back on a borrower uh, to um, uh, feed, you know, not let people know that we're fasting and praying uh, to uh, give um, uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, or, uh, you know, give the Pope, you know, extra Pope you want one, we'll give him the other one, you know. and From the Sermon uh, on the Mount. Right, right. So and, your, uh, your specific question is? So the question is, uh, are, is the reason the Church is doing this is because these are very special Gospels, uh, and are they the same evangelists, or are they different evangelists sometimes to make us, you know, to give us the, uh, 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 the seriousness of it and the uh, importance yeah. of it? Well, I can tell you as far as the readings you hear at Mass, um, Rosa, that there is, for Sunday readings, there's a three-year cycle, reading A, B, and C, and then for the daily Mass readings, there's your one and your two. And... And the year 2016, we're in year two. Uh, so that's what you'll be hearing. I mean, it starts technically in 2015 with Advent. That's when the liturgical year starts. But um, when, you, when you're, the bulk of the uh, liturgical year is in an even year, you know it's a year two, for example. And so those are all ordered. If you go, do you go to daily Mass? The reason I ask if you go to daily Mass is because sometimes you might hear a reading from... Sunday's Gospel, and it might be reaffirmed in one way or another later in the week, and that's just how it. there can be an overlap or reaffirmation in that regard. But as far as the order in general, there is a, an order that is to be followed according to Sunday readings A, B, and C, and according to weekday readings uh, years 1 and 2. However, you can sometimes have, like say it's the 11th Sunday, or excuse me, the 11th uh, week in ordinary time, that there's 34 weeks in ordinary time. You also have Easter season. You also have Lent. You also have Advent. But say it's the 13th week in ordinary time. If there's a saint uh, that falls on that day, they can take now with the expanded uh, lectionary um, readings, that readings of that saint. They might be particular readings for that particular saint's day, so those might be used or by the priest as an option. So it's, that gives a further variety to be used within the context of the Mass. And then sometimes, for example, my parish in Ann Arbor is St. Thomas, so this year it's going to be July 3rd, and July 3rd it'd normally be, you have the Sunday readings, but in that case, we can um, have, uh, we get to celebrate the uh, Feast of St. Thomas, because he's an apostle and we're named after him. 
Thanks so much for that phone call, Rosa. Tom Nash sitting in for Colin Donovan today on EWTN's Open Line Friday. What is the evidence for the existence of God? How can faith and science coexist? How can something come from nothing? Cosmic questions that still elude the mind of man. Philosopher and theologian Father Robert Spitzer ignites an infinite discourse, a transcendent Q&A of sound reason, credible science, and faithful theology. At the intersection of faith and reason, we invite you to explore Father Spitzer's universe. Sunday, noon Eastern on EWTN Radio. I'm Raymond Arroyo with Mother Angelica, A Remarkable Life. I'm in the cloister yard of Santa Clara. Now, this is a monastery. Mother Angelica spent her young years as a religious. In 1958, the nuns wanted a grotto to be built in this yard, this one here. She turned to some of the old boys she knew from the neighborhood in southeast Canton, some with a checkered history. Sixty-two brick masons and carpenters came out here to build this grotto. From then on, they would be dubbed Angelica's Tonys. Italian workers would help Mother Angelica throughout her religious life as she built the network and later her shrine in Hansville. Stay with EWTN as we continue to celebrate the life and legacy of Mother Angelica. EWTN home video highlight for June is Living the Scriptures with Mother Angelica. These vintage Mother Angelica episodes will profit your soul and cheer your spirit. Each episode demonstrates Mother's insights, wisdom, and humor, which beautifully penetrate her reflections on the Old and New Testaments. Order your DVD set at EWTNRC.com, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question or comment, call 1-800-585-9396. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. I have a suggestion for everybody in the listening audience. You need to tune in tonight to Life on the Rock. Because Father Mark and Doug will be talking to Father Louis Morazini from Haiti, and this cat is fantastic. He is a vibrant, dynamic young priest, and he is worth the price of admission, regardless of what that price would be. And tonight it just happens to be free on Life on the Rock. So tune in, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio and Television. Back to the phones we go. Anne is in Wapford, North Dakota, listening to EWTN on Real Presence Radio. And thanks for holding. You're on with Tom Nash. Hi. How are you doing, Anne? Good. I have a question. So, is it ever morally acceptable to attend a secular marriage for two individuals of the same sex? Um, I know. Oh, same sex um, of same sex couples. Yeah. I know for a religious or for a priest, because you represent the church, it wouldn't you wouldn't be able to do that. But as a lay person, if they know that you um, disagree don't with them, agree with a lifestyle. Well, would this it is, you ever hear that be, term that saying actions speak louder than words? And I think that would apply here. And because when we go to a marriage between so-called marriage. Because, you know, they'll say about marriage equality, and I would remark, respond saying, well, there's marriage reality. And two men or two women can be very good friends, uh, best friends, but when they try to add a romantic expression, then that's a distortion of God's plan. And so we should never attend such a service because it gives a public uh, affirmation, and it might also point out if you're, as a faithful Catholic, and other people would look and say, well, gee, Anne went there, must be okay somehow, and so we can potentially give scandal in the process, even though you would think, know in your mind that you don't approve of it. In one sense, the fact that you're going there signifies that you are in a, in a significant way. So in that regard, we shouldn't attend. On the other hand, um, I would encourage you to be in good contact with such people and, and let them know that I love you and I support you, and part of that 
is disagreeing with you in the expression of your friendship in this regard, but I want to keep in contact with you. I want to be friends with you. I want to be there in any way I can. You can also let them know about the great Catholic apostolate courage, uh, which is um, helps people with same-sex attraction uh, to live chaste lives and holy lives. You know, not as as one person called it. You know, white knuckles, where we're just trying to do the right thing, even though we're uh, having difficulty doing it, and it's 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 a stress. Not, I mean, we all have to carry a cross, yes. But with God's grace, things become not simply possible, but preferable. And Father Paul Check, he heads up the Courage Apostle. Are you familiar with Courage? Oh, I know the program. It's a great program. Yeah. The um, other thing, too, is there's a great thing. Uh, they have a great documentary called Desire of the Everlasting Hills, which you might want to share with your friends. Now, I understand it's a quote-unquote secular service. Are these people of Catholic heritage or, or No. The two people who are wanting to yeah, go through the ceremony. Yeah, they were raised Catholic, but they publicly left the church. They left the church. Okay, but you know, in that case, then you want to keep um, keep in contact with them, and then tell them also um, that you can appreciate and you affirm their friendship, but that this kind of an expression is not consistent with love between them. I mean, the two the two can't become one in that sense. It's obvious without getting into needless physical and anatomical descriptions that the two cannot become one. And yet at the same time, we can affirm that they are good friends and uh, encourage them to live chaste lives and uh, that they should separate as far as you know living together because that could be an occasion of sin. I've seen some cases where people end up staying together and they were just friends and, you know, they... that's But that's unusual. Someone is an occasion of sin for someone else, kind of like if a man's unmarried and he's attracted to a woman, he shouldn't be living with her even if nothing's going on because, number one, it's an occasion of sin for him, and it's also a source of scandal for someone else who says, well, gee, look at John Smith doing it. I think I can handle it. She's my good friend. You know what I'm saying? So we always want to be mindful of our actions in that regard. And I would encourage you to be good friends with these people, but express to them that you disagree with this, but I think that they'll know that your love is genuine because you're not cutting off communication with them and that you want to continue to go do things with them, including, you know, go over to their house to have dinner. It doesn't mean you at that point are endorsing what they're doing. Now, if you're spending the night, that's a different ball game. Or if you have them spend the night at your place and are in the same bed, that's a different thing. But just getting together for people with people at their wherever they happen to live and over supper, that's how we maintain communication. That's how we can witness as opposed to just saying, I'm sorry, I'm not going to talk to you unless you repent, etc. No. We always want to reach out just like our Lord did to the woman caught in adultery, as he did to the Samaritan woman who he met at the well. Always reaching out in mercy without compromising the truth. Thanks so much, Ian. Appreciate the phone call. That frees up a line for you at 1-800-585-9396. Next stop, Des Moines, Iowa, my old stomping grounds. Julie's in Des Moines listening to EWTN on Sirius XM Channel 130. Julie, what's your question today for Tom? Hi, I was calling in regards to a reading from the book of Genesis Mm -hmm. where Ham sees his father Noah drunk and naked, and he disrespects him by not covering him up. Mm. Well, my my question is, um, it's not very clear, and I want to know about going on to teach it through RCIA or through for students. What is the appropriate Catholic teaching on this? I don't. I know that people make rough inferences, but I'm not sure that's appropriate. Okay, so with regard to, we're not talking about earlier. With regard to Cain, we're talking about the sons of well, Noah, in particular Ham, right? Ham, but actually, then when he went on to put the curse on the um, Canaan, yep. Okay, because Cain's so, before Ham. I apologize. What? Go. Cain is before Cain comes before Ham. Ham is you know like, there's Cain and Abel, right? And then later on, oh, no, the I'm sorry, Noah. Cain. Cain. I'm sorry. Cain. Cain. His son. Cain, oh, son. Okay, okay. So wait, yeah. So you, are then? Are you speaking of then the children, the children of Noah, and the whole thing with regard to uncovering his nakedness? Is that what you're speaking about, as opposed yeah. to? Cain and Abel, where Cain kills no. Abel and gets in trouble? We're speaking yeah, of no, the later one, right? The later one, yes. Okay, yeah. When he goes on to curse Cain. It Cain's has been son. speculated as to what was going on there, and um, that, uh, you know, they talk about the Canaanites, and that, in that regard, that there was sexual misbehavior uh, yeah. on the part of uncovering the nakedness, that it might have been incestual action on the part of Ham in that regard. Uh, and covering the nakedness of, um, with regard to sleeping with his mother is one possibility. 
obviously it's 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 understood to be sexual misbehavior of one sort or another and exactly. uh, and is it appropriate though since it's in, you're inferring it you don't know for sure no no well that I mean that's solid exegesis from from I know from exegesis stuff but the question is are you talking about what age appropriate or well how should we pose this when teaching this to someone else do you like we were told that um yes it was an incestuous relation with his mother yes okay well do we we do we know that for sure that, is that what that the goes back on the it? the un- the metaphor uncovering the nakedness and that that's how it's understood and so and of course that's not uncommon and you know actually with regard to not to go far afield here but it's actually connected Matthew 19 and the whole pornea clause uh, except for unchastity, some people, unfortunately, um, modern-day Protestants and Protestants for actually hundreds of years have said that, oh, this means I can get divorced and remarried under the case of adultery. But that's not the case. There can be separation of bed and board. The actual meaning of porne or unchastity would be more to the point of being uh, having a marriage with, within too close of the bloodlines. That is, for example, mother and uh, son, sister and brother, uh, that kind of a thing. So that would be the unchastity that's spoken of. That's that's a uh, a, a better understanding of that than the one where you can get divorced and remarried. So there are some good um, exegesis out there. Scott Hahn's done some stuff, uh, salvationhistory.com, uh, EW10. We might have something on that, EW10.com. Also, for further, if you wanted you know, to research that further, if you wanted to get a specific theologian. But I remember having... Um, studied this, that the sin of Canaan was understood, and it's, it's commonly understood that when uncovering one's nakedness is a metaphor, uh, that the father's nakedness is, is understood as a metaphor for incest. Okay. Okay. That's what I just and I, I think sure if you want to get further teaching scholarly them. support, uh, you might want to check with a you know, restricted search on the engines of uh, the, the search engine, like Google, using that at, with salvationhistory.com and using words like Cain and, and, and sins, also um, catholic.com or ew10.com. And then there's another one. If you look up the Scripture Scholars, John Bergsma, his website, he has, um, I'm trying to remember if it's Sacred Page, but those guys are all very good Scripture Scholars, Scott Hahn, John Bergsma, and you can, might have further elaboration on that, uh, and they might get into the original languages as well. God bless you, Julie. Appreciate the phone call. Straight ahead, we'll talk to Robert in Canton, Ohio, Dolores in Albany, New York, and we've got plenty of time for your phone calls at 1-800-585-9396. That's toll-free anywhere in North America. 1-800-585-9396. Open line Friday with Tom Nash. Why did millions of people tune in each week to listen to Mother Angelica on her live television program? Because she had the answers. Whatever the question, problem, or heartbreaking sorrow, guided by the Holy Spirit and directed by the teachings of the Church, Mother Angelica had straightforward solutions to life's puzzling problems. Mother Angelica's Answers, Not Promises, a profoundly practical, humorous, and common-sense collection. Available now at EWTNRC.com. Monday on EWTN Radio's Open Line Show, John Martinoni takes your questions about the Bible and the Catholic Church, 3 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. It's new. It's Catholic. It's live from our studios at Christ Cathedral. Call Me Catholic with Peggy Normandon. A full hour of talk, interviews, and commentary on faith. Celebrating, exploring, and restoring our Catholic identity in a modern world. Call Me Catholic every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question or comment, call 1-800-585-9396. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. 
Be sure to keep it right here on many of these EWTN affiliated radio stations coming up at 4 Eastern Cresta in the afternoon. And Al will be live from the Acton Institute today. He'll talk to Dr. John Panero as well as Michael Miller. And then at 6 Eastern, two hours of Catholic Answers Live. Hour number one, Carl Keating. And hour number two, Carlo Broussard. Our engineer extraordinaire, Chip Gimberg, is spinning the dials back in the control room right now, channeling his inner Bob Greasy with his Miami Dolphins t-shirt on, and uh, hopefully you can hear us. It's not that I don't trust Chip. It's just, Well, yeah, it is that I don't trust Chip, so hopefully we're on the air and everybody can hear us. Back to the phones we go. Robert is in Canton, Ohio, listening to EWTN on Living Bread Radio. Robert, what's your question today for Tom Nash? My question is on... Uh on June 8th, there was a combined prayer service, including uh, Catholics, Jews, and Muslims, broadcast uh, live from the Vatican. And uh, now knowing that uh, the Muslim religion is a false religion started by a false prophet, is it, was it a good idea to broadcast uh, prayers from the Koran, from the Vatican? Well, I guess I'd have to, I didn't see all that happen, but I know that some people, there can be misunderstandings in that regard, Robert. Uh, for example, when Pope Benedict went to the Blue Mosque several years ago, when he was uh, still serving as Pope, and he prayed silently with uh, the imam there, and um, he was not engaging in a interfaith prayer as, as if it was religiously indifferent. Uh, and... So, rather, he was showing a solidarity without compromising the truth of Catholicism. Like, here's a person who's sincerely seeking God. And Vatican II documents recognize that Islam does have elements of truth, including that even in a distorted way, and you're right about Muhammad not being an authentic prophet, but that in, a, in a, an imperfect way, he's seeking the God of Abraham, whom we also worship. We understand his Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They would understand God. They wouldn't even call him Father, unfortunately, but they understand him as the God of Abraham, and, and that's true itself. With regard to the prayers that were um, read, I'm not certain. I can't speak with specificity, but I imagine that they would have been things that would not have been in conflict with the faith. In other words, things that would be praising God in general as opposed to things that would uh, contradict Catholic doctrine in particular. Um, I didn't see this covered. I'm it's kind of interesting. I've been in transition <laughs> last week, doing moving from one place to another within Ann Arbor. Uh, but I didn't. Nothing hit the uh, news wire like that, as if something was major and out of whack. And with regard to this, so I don't think there was probably something amiss. I understand the whole thing of appearance, and you never want to have the appearance of religious indifferentism. But it's another thing too, where people can get together in some kind of a general prayer service, and as long as the Catholic is not praying specific Muslim prayers. That's one, th you know. That's one thing. And if somebody perhaps were reading at, from the Quran and it wasn't at odds with uh, Christian doctrine, then that potentially can be okay as well. So, without knowing further, it's hard for me to comment further. Still have time for your phone calls at one eight hundred five eight five nine three nine six. That's toll free anywhere in North America with your questions for Tom Nash. One eight hundred five eight five nine three nine six. That's the number Mark used in New Brunswick, Canada. He's listening to EWTN on Sirius XM channel one thirty. Mark, thanks for holding. You're on with Tom Nash. Hey, Tom. Thanks for taking my call. Well, um, my question is actually kind of off what you had mentioned to a caller earlier about mm. staying at someone's house. Um, that, uh, well, you were talking about same-sex attraction at the time. Yes. And um, having them sleep over. Um, I personally have stayed at my sister's place who's not recognized as married in the Catholic Church, as she's Catholic and is not married. Mm. And um, I stay there because she just lives closer to my work when my shifts overlap. And I'm wondering, does that create some type of scandal? Hmm. Like, I'm Interesting. Not sure. how, far is, how far are you from work? Well, to be honest, it's only 30 minutes. Okay. Uh, like, I'll work till 1 o'clock in the morning, and then I work at 9, so I just, instead of driving home and driving back in, if, um, or, if, I mean, so that'd be technically an hour, 30 minutes in, 30 minutes out, got I it. would just stay at her place. Got it. So, in other words, you might, um, do you do that, but once or twice a week? Yeah. Got it. Um, I would say if, 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 you know, if the difference is between falling asleep and staying there, we don't want to get in a, in a fatal car crash. I think, on the other hand, um, it's good to be witnessing to her, uh, and I, I think it would be ideal if you, you made the trip back or made it some other ways, and if you explained why you weren't staying with her, and not to say that you can't have fellowship with her. 
Um, but you know, to staying the night can get, can give an appearance of of approval of something that you don't approve of. Um, a lot of people may not know about it, right? So that's you know, something that doesn't need to be broadcast wide and far. I would say if you can drive home, that'd be ideal, and and yet still have fellowship with your sister. Um, that would be ideal versus the fact that now she's she's been away from the church. She just did she leave the church formally, or in any case, it would be not a valid marriage. And once, although she can have it blessed, is it is she become has she embraced a Christianity of another sort, or what is her situation? Yeah, no, she uh, was uh, baptized and brought up Catholic, and then eventually just like my other five brothers and sisters, uh, just stopped attending and just lived out their life for themselves. Got it. There's so no, she's yeah. um, not. She didn't become a Baptist or something. She's just not going to church at all. Correct. Okay. And the person she married was they married in the they weren't married in the church. And is that person um, only one marriage for them? Well, I, in this particular case, I have a lot of brothers and sisters. Sure. And some of them are are married to Justice of the Peace, and Got some it. of them to other whatever religious groups. And in this case, um, she's actually just. Uh, um, she's actually not married. She's just living with uh, with her boyfriend. Oh, so she's um, but, cohabiting. So they didn't even make a lifetime commitment. Correct. Even in even in an imperfect civil sense. Yeah. I would um I wouldn't stay, and uh, unless you were so tired that going home would have been a problem, you know, put your life at risk. And I, I would no I, I would explain to her why I'm not doing. It. I don't know if you have friends or something else, or even if sleeping in the car that might not be easy for you. But it's a kind of uh, a cross I would encourage you to embrace again, not to go so far as to if you were so tired that you didn't have some place to stay, you would um, maybe fall asleep and, and jeopardize your own life. That's what I would say, staying over. But I would explain to her why you weren't doing that. And I know that makes it a little more onerous, and maybe you have to take some you know, five-hour energy or something else if you're tired to get home. But I think that would be a better witness because you'd be explaining why and hopefully she'd at least move to the fact of trying to move to some kind of a commitment. Has this person been married before? Have they both never been married? Uh, no, they're they're quite clear. Like our family is quite really quite Catholic. <laughs> no, I got you. Um, I mean, is she clear. the man she's cohabiting with? Is he? I'm just wondering about how many impediments they have if they decided to get married. Is would this be her first marriage? Would this be his first marriage? Yeah, if, if they they could technically that get badly married in the Catholic Church. Okay, well that's any. that's. Yeah. That makes it a little easier down the road. I would not. I would not stay. I wouldn't because you're worrying about appearances. Because if you're staying, it's like, well, how bad can it be if Mark's willing, who's the faithful, uh, one of the faithful Catholics in the family, and he stays overnight, and he knows that I'm um, sharing bed and board with my boyfriend, etc. I think it'd be a more powerful witness and a, and a more consistent one to do otherwise. And All I right, think, well, thank you. I, I think God will bless you for that. All right. Well, thanks, Tom. I appreciate your time, sir. You're welcome. Hey, one other thing, uh, Jack, if I may, from the Go. previous caller, sure. Julie was talking about uncovering the nakedness, and I um, confirmed that with Scott Hans saying from SalvationHistory.com that in Hebrew this phrase is a figure of speech used to describe incest. And then he cites besides Genesis 9.22, Leviticus 20, chapter 20, verse 17, and, verses, and chapter 18, verses 6 to 18. So there, and then we say figure of speech, as I, that's another term for metaphor, um, so it's in other places besides the story of Noah and Ham. And the New American Bible translates this phrase as to, quote-unquote, have intercourse. So it, it takes the metaphor and tells it what it is in common English, therefore, incest. But the Revised Standard Version, in all cases, keeps the more literal translation, which is uncovering the nakedness of it. So it preserves the metaphor. Uh, but, you know, the, the NAB is leaving no doubt what it means when it translates it in one sense, it's more literal to say uncover the nakedness because you're being true to the words of, I mean, to the words of Scripture, but yet, at the same time, when you say to describe intercourse, you're being very clear of what that metaphor means. So both are correct, and both would point out to, to reaffirm Julie that, indeed, that's the sin of incest with the story of Ham uncovering his father's nakedness. Noel from Northern Ireland writes in, I was wondering if someone doesn't ask for forgiveness, verbally at least, do I still forgive them? Yes, I would say that you should always forgive, and and that, um, if for no other reason, I mean, that's the right thing to do. And you could say, maybe that person isn't ready to receive it, maybe they don't even realize it. They say, I don't care, I didn't do anything to you. It's good for ourselves, number one, just to let it go and to not let resentment build up. 
and so that we can move on because when we don't move when we don't forgive um, it's like they say resentment is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies so for our, for our own well-being if nothing else we want to do it and part of that well-being is to be act like Christ did you know father forgive them they know not what they do well sometimes people know fully what they're doing but um, we still need to forgive them so as to show them God's mercy and to be a channel of mercy for them and to show them that uh, as an example of Christ that they too can be reconciled with God and that we can live with that power and they hopefully will be impressed and, and attracted by the fact that even though they've done something wrong that we can be still joyful and loving. It doesn't mean that we have to be in a relationship with someone where they're always uh, acting in an abusive way, not at all. But we need to, um, that's why the church has separation of bed aboard when you have abusive spouses. On the other hand, we talk about a friend we, we can keep a little distance from. We need to always forgive in any event. And that's good not only for the other person and, and witnessing them to showing the power of forgiveness, but also for our own spiritual well-being. A couple of minutes left here. Darlene says, how do I respond when someone says they don't go to the graveside of a departed person, quote-unquote, since they aren't really there? What's the Catholic belief regarding this topic? Well, we know that the faithful departed's uh, earthly remains are still there, and uh, the, that's why the Church has cemeteries. And we go there, I mean, it's like with regard to a saint statue. Well, the saint can be there spiritually, but we, we, that, that helps us focus, just like a photo on the wall helps us focus about loved ones, whether they be in the same room or maybe across the country. So, to that grave is a reminder of that person uh, that is where we laid them to rest in terms of their earth remains, and that we um, hope and pray one day they rise the resurrection of the dead in, in a very positive way. So, the focus of the grave site is to remind ourselves, number one, this person has died, they've died in Christ, we hope and pray, and that this is also points us towards, reminds us of our own earthly journey, right, that we too will have to die and have to render an account, and it, re, and it also reminds us of the whole resurrection of the dead, and doing that at any other place in the grave site is not going to have the same effect, because we know that we are in contact with them, and, and indeed, um, we always pray for the repose of the soul of those who have died, but it also helps us focus on them, and you know, we don't know where they're at, per se. They could be in heaven. We always want to pray for them. God always uses those prayers, even if someone's already attained heaven. Um, we, it, it's a way by which we can um, further our solidarity with a departed loved one, in, in specifically, as well as the communion of saints in general, and asking them to pray for that loved one if that loved one still needs prayers, and doing so our same ourselves and offering Masses as well. Tom, where can we find a copy of the Biblical Roots of the Mass? Uh, you can available on Sophia Institute Press's uh, website and also Catholic bookstores and other uh, online sites around the country. On behalf of our host, Tom Nash, producer Elena Rodriguez, call screener Matt Gubensky, and engineer extraordinaire Chip Gimberg. I'm Jack Williams, thanking you for taking some time out of your day to join us on Open Line. Back at it again Monday, talking apologetics with John Martinoni. Until we get together then, God bless.